Let's talk some energy. America is definitely in need of it as the AI revolution demands power. Let's talk about nuclear power with James Walker, the CEO and head of reactor development at Nano Nuclear Energy. The business went public via IPO in May. Shares up about 12% ish, or no more than that, sorry. Shares since the debut up about 180%. Welcome to the show, James. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Oliver. Good to be here. So tell us about your business. You've got a pretty cool title as well, uh, alongside CEO, head of uh, reactor development. So uh, you guys are in the small modular reactor business. Uh, is that correct? Yep. So there's a there's a slight definition in the industry where a small modular reactor is really anything above 20 megawatts, whereas uh, anything below 20 megawatts is considered a micro reactor. Um, and it's targeting a different market. So there's not really any competition between an SMR and a micro reactor, but the micro reactor we pursued that route because um it was a more uncontested area within the nuclear space but we we thought potentially the larger market because remote uh, remote industry remote habitation island communities military bases all of these sort of areas um there's it's, it's they're powered by diesel and there's no competition for these diesel generators until micro reactors are ready to be deployed and and then we've got um then for the first time you've got a consistent form of power anywhere you want in the world so that's what we're building. Okay. Uh, we've got in Illinois uh, more nuclear power that we generate than any state uh, in America, I think as of at least uh, uh, data from a couple of years back. So we've got a lot of nukes here basically, uh, but a lot of uh, old facilities as well. Can you kind of generally just kind of talk to us about how the new nuclear tech, the micro and the small modular stuff that you're developing fits into the existing nuclear framework? So it's it's interesting because I think small modular reactors were almost industry's response to some of the challenges with big with big plants. Um, and just to give an example of say um, some of the issues with a big plant is that because because when you build a nuclear facility, all your fuel is at the front end, uh, right at the, the time of deployment. Um, you've got a, that big upfront capital cost, but because you've got that upfront capital cost, there's a big financing cost that's associated with that capital cost. And that can sometimes be 70% of the entire project. So the nuclear power is theoretically cheap, but the paperwork and the financing around it is expensive. Mm. So a small modular reactor, the idea behind them is that you would mass manufacture a lot of reactor systems. You would deploy, um, so you get economies of scale. Then you're looking at a um, reduced site licensing time, um, already approved reactors, um, and then if you reduce that capital cost, you reduce that financing cost. So it's it's really industry's sort of solution around some of the challenges that um, affected the big power plants. And you're looking to try and reduce that time to deployment from the order to when power is output. Um, and on the micro reactor front, um, it, it simplifies it even more. What we want to do is actually take a take a micro reactor and just put it, um, send it to the location you you need it, put it down, plug it in, start outputting power. So mm. if you can do that, then you can you can really take advantage of economies of scale and produce hundreds of these things, if not thousands, and deploy them all over the world. And then you really drive down those capital and financing costs. Now, uh, from what I understand, it seems like the international world has been a little bit more receptive. I know that the Middle East uh, has been very much proactive in building some of these reactors. Uh, from what I understand, China too. Uh, what about here in the U.S.? Uh, or so that's kind of the first question: is U.S. versus the rest of the world? How's the appetite for what you're building? And then number two is where are your markets uh, uh, mostly, James? So um, we're a U.S.-based company, um, but the there's a there's a number of locations within the U.S. that we're going to be targeting originally. But th this has international potential and some very very large international potential. So just to give you an idea of industries outside of the US, when you're looking at, say, countries with a lot of island communities, like you take Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines, that, those kind of areas, you've got hundreds of millions of people living over dozens and dozens of islands that all subsist on diesel um, uh, diesel power. And that's very expensive power, too, because you are importing that fuel on a daily basis into these locations. Um, so it's one, very dirty, two, logistically complicated, and three, very expensive. So this is a time where we could ship hundreds of these reactor systems and still it would only cater to a small component of the international market. And mm. we, we recently put together an agreement with the Rwandan government because they've got a lot of remote communities too, where if you were to send these reactor systems to these remote areas, 
Um, you suddenly have an ability to have desalination in those areas. You have you can have vertical farms. You can have um, you can have heat for power systems like remote mining hall concentration. When you're doing stuff like that, then your market is absolutely enormous. And it's you know we're not the first country to think of this. Obviously, you mentioned um, China as an example. I think they have more nuclear power plants um uh being built at the moment and the rest of the world combined or it's mm. certainly very close maybe 45 percent of them because they've also come to the conclusion that nuclear is their solution to their long-term energy requirements and just like the us is now anticipating a huge rise in energy uh, requirements because of tech centers data centers ai energy requirements um, China's are trying to get ahead in the same way and make sure that they're going to build dozens of these um, small modular reactors throughout the company, uh, country to, to make sure there's enough power to power these big tech, tech industries. That's particularly what I was thinking about here, too, is because we've already seen a lot of articles talking about the uh, lack of power uh, in a lot of these areas. Uh, in theory, I mean, uh, is there a way to uh, just drop these uh, SMRs like right next to these data centers and stuff? I mean, are you guys, are your call, are your phones ringing off the hook with uh, all the Silicon Valley guys right now or what? There, there's a huge amount of demand. I mean, I think the tech industries are very nervous now about how far they can advance without the power that they need to advance. And so even at Google, Microsoft, you see them appointing people who have expertise in nuclear to go out and find power solutions because nuclear has certain advantages over every other power source. One, you can put it anywhere, which you can't say about wind or solar or geothermal or hydro. Um, and it's it's uh, the highest capacity factor form of power, which really just means consistency. You can consistently output power so you have that baseload energy and you know exactly how long you can operate for. And it's not subject to fluctuations in, say, oil prices. You know upfront what your costs will be over time. So it's got it's got all these big advantages. Mm. And for that reason, the tech industry has sort of settled on nuclear as being the solution that it needs to, to power its industry. And if it doesn't come up, if it doesn't put those means in place, it's going to get to a point where it plateaus in terms of capability mm. and the sophistication of its own AI models or um, data center capacities, and it's going to get stagnant. And obviously, it's a very tech industry is very dynamic. Um, they have a lot of money. It's a lot of that investment is has to go into energy because these things don't power themselves. Uh, there is also still sort of a cultural societal pushback to some extent in some of the nuclear uh, world, even uh, uh, here in Illinois, where we've already got this baseline of nuclear plants. It took a while uh, up until last year, I think it was, uh, the, the lawmakers here approved a plan to start uh, small scale nuclear development. Is there, um, I'm curious, and, and I guess speak as frankly as, as you feel, but is there competition like from, say, like a constellation that owns a bunch of like traditional nuclear plants? Do you feel any resistance when you're trying to move the technology into the kind of the more micro uh, realm by the existing nuclear uh, uh, businesses? Is, is, is that a tough nut to crack when governments are already kind of resistant and then you've got like the existing nuclear, uh, you know, I, I guess lobby or industry? How difficult is that? Well, it's it's got a lot easier for us very recently. Like when you mentioned the okay. government, I mean, they had a they had a vote very recently on an advance, uh, what's called the Advance Act, and that was uh, legislation that was pushed through to try and um, facilitate the introduction of more nuclear power within the country. And the vote was eighty eight to two, so it's big bipartisan support on both on both sides. And the reasons are quite clear. It's that. The US needs this. It's going to fall behind in terms of technological development if it doesn't have the power to, to power these systems. Um, and, you know, the US knows that. And tradi uh, historically, there was a big reliance on Russian material brought into the country. You know, as you can imagine, that relationship with Russia is very damaged now. Sure. And being able to source from them at that, that, that kind of ability is going to go by the wayside. Right. So the, the domestic industry needs to be built back. And the government is essentially throwing money at the industry now through RFPs and funding opportunities to build back and increase the capacity of the, the domestic nuclear industry. Um, so on that front, um, there's nothing to worry about from the government. With with regard to the competition from, yes. say, larger traditional plants, 
Um, we are catering to a ver at the micro reactor level. We're catering to a very different market. Mm, so okay. the traditional plants, um, you're powering cities, you're powering towns, big, big, big things like that. Micro reactors, um, they're powering, you know, military bases, mining sites, oil and, oil and gas rigs, mm. places where nuclear power or, or any sort of grid, mainline grid has never powered before. So there's there's actually no overlap in terms of market. Interesting. If they actually do well, the big reactor systems, and I, I include the big SMRs in that too. Mm -hmm. If they do well, that's very good for the industry and that benefits us hugely. So okay. we're actually very supportive of these big power systems. And actually, I re we really hope they succeed because it, it builds up the industry and allows right. for us too. So they're pretty separate, pretty separate markets then where those facilities will just function on their own sort of course. There's no real like overlap. It's not like, okay, we can take an old dilapidated nuclear uh, facility and, you know, it's, it's totally, it's, it's a different function. Yeah. So <clears throat> they're, they're definitely catering for different things, a micro reactor, yeah. a big civil power plant. Now, uh, a small modular reactor, which is obviously larger than a, a micro reactor, some of those um, that they're looking at, though, they're still 300, 400 megawatt systems. Mm. They're still fairly large um, power output. Um, but they, those sort of systems, they would be powering cities and towns. Again, no conflict for a micro reactor company building these re systems for remote power. Yeah. Um, but the future of nuclear is very likely to be small modular reactors over large reactor systems because you're going to have economies of scale when you produce these things. They are more modular. Mm. They are more inherently safe. And I want to preface when I say that because it's I think the the public misconception about nuclear is that it's not safe when in right. fact objectively if you look at deaths per gigawatt hour it's the safest form of energy out there and that includes wind and solar as well in that estimation as well okay but you get even safer because you have passive cooling built into the mechanism so the traditional accident scenarios you can get with a large reactor aren't really possible when you shrink the reactor systems down hmm. um so the Very future cool. is certainly going to be these advanced small modular reactor systems. And in remote locations, there's huge potential for micro reactor systems to power where diesel has been before and had no competition. All right. Hey, real quick, James, like how many for perspective? Like, let's say I want to build a third airport in Chicago. How many are SMRs would I need to, to power that? Well, that's size a, of uh, you, you sprung that on me because I don't know the power requirements of, a, of an airport. But <laughs> okay, say, fair enough. I don't know, say it's uh, a few hundred megawatts. Um, oh, you can do you knock can it out with one. one what, what's that? You can knock it out with one. Yeah, you can knock it out with one. One small modular reactor would power that airport system pretty competently. So. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, thanks, uh, James, for your time. Uh, let's circle back, talk more about the company financials and plan as a great uh, introduction. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, James Walker, CEO and head of reactor development, at Nano Nuclear Energy, uh, making me feel like I need a, a bigger title, head of reactor development. Very cool stuff.